to see this talk uh, on small satellite missions and to have it on our, uh, our webinar record for posterity. So uh, without further ado, uh, sure me luck. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, uh, IFT, for organizing this and inviting me to present this talk on technologies uh, that have been incorporated in uh, small satellite missions, uh, but they have been very impactful. And so, hence the title, Small But Mighty Missions. Uh, I'm Sharmila Padmanabhan, and I work at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I've been at JPL for about 15 years. Uh, let's see, a bit about myself. I was uh, born in India. Uh, grew up in India and uh, did my undergraduate in uh, electronics and telecommunication engineering. Uh, and then, uh, like a lot of Indian immigrant students, I uh, applied for grad school to come to the U.S. and uh, pursue my uh, master's and uh, potentially Ph.D. At the time, I didn't know. But, uh, yeah, I got accepted at a number of schools and I decided to go to University of Massachusetts, Amherst and they had a great remote sensing program and uh, worked on several ground-based radiometers uh, under uh, the advisorship of uh, Professor Steve Rising. And uh, after I completed my master's in electrical and computer engineering, Professor Rising decided to move to Colorado State University and I followed him to pursue my PhD. Uh, and during my PhD, uh, so during my master's, I worked on ocean remote sensing, uh, basically measuring the emissivity of foam and breaking waves, which was used for calibration validation of the Vinsat uh, polarimetric radiometers on, uh, on board Vinsat. So at the time, uh, they were Navy was sponsoring uh, the U.S. Navy was sponsoring these uh, measurements using ground-based radiometers to characterize the emissivity of foam. Uh, and then at Colorado State, I worked on a ground-based radiometer network for measuring water vapor uh, in the atmosphere. So atmospheric water vapor sensing using uh, multiple radiometers uh, stationed sort of in an equilateral triangle, ground-based looking upward uh, and implemented azimuth and elevation scanning to do 3D water vapor fields. So that was my PhD dissertation. And then uh, after I completed my PhD, I was... Uh, uh, higher. So this was uh, measurements I, we did in Rome. Uh, this was one of the radiometer on the, on the roof of uh, University of La Sapienza uh, uh, in Rome. And uh, we had uh, two other radiometers stationed in the uh, University of Tor Vargata and uh, also in a Professor Pierre Dicca's house. He's actually the, uh, the technical committee chair for uh, the modeling and remote sensing community. Uh, so after I completed my PhD, I got hired at uh, JPL 15 years ago. Uh, and at JPL, I had the pleasure to work on a number of R&D projects, including airborne measurements, uh, 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 R&D measurements that uh, were in partnership with Colorado State, um, as well as internally at JPL. So back in 20. 12, actually in 2010 is when we started thinking about putting radiometers in CubeSats. And the first CubeSat that we built was uh, in, implemented in a 3U CubeSat. CubeSats are uh, sort of each cube is 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. And uh, the 3U was sort of a 30 centimeters by 10 centimeters uh, sort of form factor, sort of little shoebox sort of form factor. We put in a 183 gigahertz radiometer in a 3U. Unfortunately, that one was, uh, it couldn't, uh, uh, had a launch failure and couldn't make it to orbit. Uh, and then after that, we worked, started working on six U CubeSats, sort of a serial box sized uh, CubeSats. And uh, this was a R&D project internally funded by JPL, where we implemented 118 and 183 um, humidity and uh, temperature sounding radiometer. So this was sort of a research project that was implemented in an aircraft. We, we put it on the, DC, the, the belly of the DC-8, uh, NASA DC-8 aircraft, flew it with uh, radar uh, prototypes that could also fit in a small form factor, which sort of developed into the RainCube and Tempest-D missions. So 
a lot of exciting work at JPL, also worked on a number of Earth science missions like Jason-3, Sentinel-6, SWAT, um, et cetera, and the COVER, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, flight missions that I've worked on. This is uh, currently I'm working on my seventh mission. Um, so a lot of exciting work at JPL. So that that's a bit about myself. And in 2019, uh, I got the uh, NASA Exceptional uh, Achievement Award for the Tempest D implementation, which I'll talk about. So uh, coming to small sat, low cost missions, uh, we've been doing several of those in the last decade. Uh, the the interest kind of came about because of the low cost of uh, launch for these missions in, into low Earth orbit and also the uh, uh, ease and implementation of a uh, number of measurement concepts and technology demonstration of new technologies that we had been working on through uh, Earth Science Technology funding uh, using IIP Instrument Incubator, Advanced Component Technology Program. So uh, this presented a good opportunity of uh, uh, implementing these technologies on orbit and uh, looking at uh, different measurement concepts with multiple instruments. <clears throat> so uh, the, the key advantage of using these low cost small sat CubeSat missions is you get a opportunity to uh, hitchhike or piggyback or ride share with other uh, uh, primary uh, payloads or let's say primary spacecrafts that go on launch vehicles and uh, that ends up in a lot of cost savings for launch opportunities which uh, speaking of uh, other flagship missions such as SWAT or SMAP that have dedicated launches, uh, you know, spend uh, millions of dollars for uh, on launch. So we started thinking, as I mentioned earlier, about CubeSat, small sats in 2010, uh, came up with our first 3U CubeSat radiometer, which was a, a NASA HOPE uh, sort of a partnership with the NASA Center and JPL uh, early career flight training program called the Phaeton program. And so I started JPL in about uh, end of 2008. So this was right about when I was an early career at uh, JPL and uh, we had a chance to work on this, although I wasn't directly involved, but I had a lot of colleagues who worked on this uh, 183 gigahertz radiometer, which uh, uh, unfortunately didn't make it to orbit. It was called Charm and then it was, uh, the name was changed to Race. And so that was sort of the first CubeSat we developed, uh, one of the first CubeSats we developed at JPL. Of course, you might have heard about the Marcos that uh, went to Mars uh, for Mars communication. And we had Asteria, which was an other astrophysics related uh, CubeSat. So there's several CubeSat developments at JPL, but I had the pleasure of working on several Earth science mission CubeSats, namely Tempest-D, Pre-Fire, and uh, currently working on EZ, which is a NASA heliophysics mission, although it's an Earth orbiting constellation. So uh, without further ado, let's talk about Tempest-D. So Tempest-D was proposed as an Earth Ventures mission, uh, sorry, Earth Ventures instrument uh, uh, concept uh, back in 2013. Uh, the PI was Professor Steve Rising at Colorado State and JPL was gonna be building uh, five uh, instruments um, spanning from 89 gigahertz all the way to 183 gigahertz or 182 rather. And we would have four channels near the water vapor line to be able to uh, provide uh, the water vapor uh, content uh, in the atmosphere. And uh, the, the, the uh, objective of having five satellites was to get the temporal evolution of how storms develop and um, how, how they would develop into bigger storms or would uh, decay down. And so to understand the temporally resolved measurements of clouds and precipitation processes, we had uh, proposed a constellation of five 6U CubeSats, uh, which were flying in sort of a pros on a string configuration. And uh, with each of them flying these identical five channel radiometers spaced five minutes apart, uh, these did not have any propulsion. This was back in 2013 when CubeSats were sort of new in the game and uh, it was about maybe 50% success rate on CubeSats. So this was a bit early with respect to uh, these uh, constellation concepts. So NASA didn't uh, pick this full constellation. Uh, instead, they said, 
we pick you for a technology demonstration where you show that you can actually build and demonstrate uh, good science quality radiometers, good well calibrated radiometers uh, on orbit. And so we were picked for a single 60 CubeSat demonstration, um, and uh, which we started implementing in 2015. Uh, so uh, August of 2015 is when uh, we started implementation of the Tempest D radiometer. And in 2017, we delivered the radiometer to the, the CubeSat developer, Blue Canyon Technologies, who then uh, integrated the radiometer into the 6U CubeSat and did uh, at low level spacecraft level testing. And we then launched in 2018 from the uh, ISS. So we have, uh, we had opportunity to deploy the, uh, the CubeSat from the NanoRacks sort of shelves that are located on the ISS. And so we had an, a launch to the ISS in one of the, uh, uh, the Cygnus launches, which are basically, uh, uh, you know, happen every uh, every quarter, and then uh, from the ISS, we got launched or deployed on orbit in March, uh, in May of 2018. Uh, sorry, July of 2018, and then uh, this is supposed to be a, a technology development or the technology demonstration that was uh, last uh, supposed to last on orbit for about 90 days, but uh, we ended up operating for about three years before. Uh, we precessed and uh, re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. So this was around 400 kilometers is where we got deployed. And uh, it took about two and a half, uh, little uh, uh, more than two and a half years before it, it started getting into altitudes where the CubeSat was difficult to control uh, and uh, point in attitude. And uh, so the AD, uh, ADCS system started uh, becoming problematic once you're about 325 kilometers and lower. So that's when we stopped operating and it, it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere in like 2021. <clears throat> so uh, that was uh, the Tempest D, as I, as I mentioned, uh, it was led by Professor Steve Rising and it was a partnership between CSU, JPL and BCT. Uh, so uh, we had a number of collaborators. Uh, we also had the atmospheric science department at Colorado State providing calibration validation support. Professor Chris Kumarov, uh, Wes Berg um, for inner satellite calibration, also comparison with uh, uh, GMI uh, the, uh, on GPM, as well as uh, combined measurements with RainCube and Tempest D. So the RainCube uh, kind of, um, fortunately was also launched on the very same day from the ISS. So RainCube was a invest program, which was a 35 gigahertz rain radar uh, built by JPL that was uh, launched also from the ISS. Uh, again, downward looking uh, at earth. And so we had uh, the fortunate uh, combined measurements of uh, combined as in uh, RainCube uh, and Tempest D overpasses over the same precipitation events such as hurricanes and uh, tropical storms. And RainCube was about 30 minutes, 30 minutes to an hour uh, behind, uh, you know, uh, around Tempest D on a very similar orbit because it was also deployed from the ISS. So uh, uh, these were excellent measurements which were uh, difficult to uh, measure uh, from larger satellites because we hadn't uh, deployed these kind of uh, uh, sensors before. Uh, and the revisit time on these larger flagship missions are a lot longer. So uh, to make these uh, repeat pass measurements, the, the concept was if you had uh, sensors coming along and measuring these events in, in, in a very time resolved, uh, uh, with a time resolved capability that, that gives you a lot more information about how these processes develop. And uh, so the key thing about the Tempest D radiometer is uh, achieving the radiometric resolution and the noise performance required for these kind of measurements. And so I'll get into that. Our requirements for, uh, at least for this technology demonstration was to show an absolute accuracy of four Kelvin or better uh, with the inner, because we had a, uh, a constellation, we wanted to get inter-satellite position of two Kelvin or better. 
but we didn't get a chance to put a constellation on orbit. So we had a, a single CubeSat, and so we were comparing those with other uh, similar radiometers on orbit operating at uh, these uh, frequencies, uh, similar frequencies, and uh, some of them I'll talk about in the next few slides. Uh, let's see, the, the enabling technology on Tempest D were the uh, low noise indium phosphide amplifier technology that allowed us to get uh, the low noise performance, which ended up uh, with a low radiometric resolution or sensitivity below, um, uh, you know, less than our our goal was to achieve better than a Kelvin, and you'll see how how well we did in in a couple of slides from now. So, let's see. This is all just kind of repeating what I said earlier. And of of course, these six U satellites don't did not have any propulsion. So the idea with the constellation was to use the atmospheric drag drag maneuvers to uh, space them. Uh, whatever temporal, temporally, however you need to space them. In this case, we wanted to do five to 10 minutes apart between each satellite. So a little bit about the, the radiometer uh, uh, architecture. Uh, we had a cross-track scanning uh, reflector, which was uh, uh, scanning at 30 RPM, so uh, a revolution in two seconds. Uh, and we had... Um, thermal radiation basically incident into the feed horn. We have a very wide band feed horn that spans from um, 89 gigahertz uh, all the way to G band in uh, the 165 to 182 gigahertz range, which is on the lower side band of the water vapor resonance frequency at uh, 183.25. And we had an internal ambient target, as you can see here, uh, which was built by Zach's uh, loads. Uh, Zach, uh, David Zachary owns that company, and they built multiple uh, calibration targets for other space missions. We had a brushless DC motor to spin the, the reflector. And the, and the key enabling technology, as I mentioned earlier, were the low noise amplifier front ends. Uh, developed using 35 nanometer indium phosphide technology, which were uh, JPL designs, but fabricated using the Northrop Grumman 35 nanometer process. <clears throat> and these were uh, implemented for uh, a lot of these in, uh, earth science technology funded uh, IIP programs, such as the, uh, the geostationary synthetic aperture radiometer concept. So we had a number of receivers uh, on the order of hundreds of uh, these front end modules that were required for these synthetic aperture radiometers. So basically we were taking that technology, implementing it in uh, a space borne radiometer uh, for the first time. So this, this was the first time we were flying these 35 nanometer indium phosphide devices. Since then, they've also flown on the Sentinel-6 mission uh, for uh, sea surface altimeter. Uh, uh, measurements and correction of the tropospheric water vapor uh, of the radar measurements on Sentinel-6 as well. So on Tempest-D, we had these uh, front-end LNA modules uh, that had a cascade of uh, these low noise amplifiers. And then we had a power divider that was then used to split the 165 to 182 gigahertz into four um, subbands, if you will. And then we had uh, pre-detection bandwidth uh, uh, selection using just waveguide filters, uh, and then followed by just uh, a combination of tunnel as well as short key diodes to uh, detect the RF power and had a command and data handling uh, circuit to digitize the detected signals and then had a uh, had an FPGA that received timing uh, from the spacecraft and did all of the, the, this was an FPGA that also had a soft code in it. So also functioned as a FPGA as well as a, a sort of a processor. And we were able to packetize all of the five SANS channels and then transmit it, it to the spacecraft. So simple enough, uh, but uh, for the first time we were implementing all of these technologies for uh, uh, for on-orbit uh, validation. And so there was quite a bit of uh, challenges involved in making these uh, robust enough to be able to operate on orbit in the environmental conditions, as well as also the, the lifetime of operations. So obviously for this, it was 90 days, but typically 
uh, we would design these for two to three years of operation. And they were all able to function way beyond a uh, uh, couple of years, as I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so it's just a picture of the uh, radiometer put together. Uh, you see the, uh, the cross-track spinning reflector, uh, the ambient target, the, the front end, the power divider, the filters, the detector modules. And then on the opposite side, you see the 89 receiver. So the same common feed horn um, basically split to the 89 side. And on the other side, you see the higher frequency 165 to 182 side. Very compactly packed radiometer. Uh, there was quite a challenge meeting all of the JPL requirements uh, because we have cabling requirements, you know, bend radii requirements. So it was, it's always a challenge to put these CubeSat instruments together because they have a very tight volume and mass and uh, power requirements as well. So here you see uh, Hurricane Lorenzo measured in 2019 by three different sensors and uh, you basically can't tell one from the other uh, and the first one was measured by AMSER2 um, flagship mission as many of you might be aware uh, on the right we see measurement made by SSMIS and in the middle you see our uh, Tempest D instrument which was built for you know uh, less than four million dollars so uh, great value for money. <laughs> uh, and also, additionally, the, the instrument was less than five kilograms. Uh, it was about four kilograms, uh, just the payload. Obviously, with the CubeSat avionics put together, the whole thing was about 12 to 13 kilograms. Um, the power dissipation was about five watts. And uh, it, it was basically packaged in a 4U volume, as you saw in the previous slide. So this is like 20 by 20 centimeters and then 10 centimeters deep. So uh, the, the most uh, important characteristic of radiometers, as many of you might know, is uh, how uh, low noise you can make these radiometers that directly impacts the radiometric resolution and the sensitivity of uh, the, the signal that can be, the, the minimum signal that can be measured accurately. So implementing these extremely low noise amplifier technology uh, allowed us to uh, have a very stable radiometric measurement over the duration of the mission. This was uh, plots put together uh, for the first 16 months of the mission. And this was compared with ATMS, uh, one of the, the uh, NOAA operational sensor, JPSS uh, operational sensors. And uh, we had other comparisons with uh, GMI. There's a paper published on this uh, for calibration validation of the Tempest D radiometer that you can look up. Uh, and we saw excellent measurements uh, and excellent stability with these, uh, these five channels on Tempest D. Uh, less than half a Kelvin for most of the frequency channels, uh, except for the highest frequency channel that had some one over F noise that contributed to a, a little bit of a higher uh, uh, noise measurement here. <clears throat> Again, comparing, uh, like I mentioned, with GPM GMI uh, and the microwave humidity sensors on uh, the MEDOP as well as the NOAA satellites, we saw very, very uh, comparable or even better performance in some cases by uh, uh, looking at sort of uh, similar order of uh, integration time and uh, the standard deviation calculated over uh, similar time frames. So excellent uh, performance uh, with the Tempest D radiometer and we had a lot of uh, coincident uh, or sort of co-located one would say separated in time measurements with the rain cube and that gave rise to the next uh, mission called INCUS, which is also under development at JPL, which is a three uh, small sat, uh, not a cube sat this time, but three small sat constellation of three radars with uh, one of them also carrying a, a Tempest D-like radiometer on it. So that's an Earth Ventures mission that was recently selected uh, and has is, uh, completed uh, the preliminary design phase and moving into implementation now. So great success, uh, Tempest D, like I mentioned, was uh, 
uh, had excellent calibration, indistinguishable from operating class operational class radiometers. So in terms of calibration, one thing I forgot to mention was because it's cross-track scanning, so every two seconds you're able to measure the internal ambient target and also look at cold space. So you have a fully externally calibrated radiometer all the way from the reflector that is essential for these type of instruments, uh, especially because when you put instruments on a CubeSat, um, even though on Tempest D actually it's a very benign thermal uh, environment and was thermally stable, but uh, when you have such a low cost uh, sort of instrument and also low swap type of implementation, you don't have a lot of power to put um, heater control systems that keeps you very stable. So you have to rely on uh, efficient external calibration to be able to remove any gain drifts or any other systematic noise here. So having external calibration was, uh, was a, a great benefit on Tempest D. Let's see, so uh, that was a great success. And then moving on from Tempest D, I worked on uh, the pre-fire mission, which is a Earth Ventures instrument mission, um, about $35 million for two CubeSats. Uh, and this was selected in 2018 uh, the PI is Professor Tr Tristan Laqueur from University of Wisconsin-Madison, and JPL was, uh, is uh, the, ma the project management uh, for the mission. Again, we partnered with Blue Canyon Technologies for the 6U CubeSats. These are two CubeSats uh, in polar orbit. Uh, from uh, deployed between 470 to 650 kilometers. Uh, again, near polar orbits, and each of them carrying uh, an identical miniaturized infrared spectrometer that made measurements from 5 microns to 54 microns with the, a spectral sampling of 0.84 microns. And the resolution that uh, varied as you went from 5 microns into the far IR. So this is the polar radiant energy, the far IR uh, experiment. And the main objective is to measure the long wave fluxes and the variability in the spectral flux. And mostly measurements do not exist beyond 15 microns, uh, or if they exist, they're very broadband. So this was a, a, a very new and unique uh, capability that we were able to implement in a very small form factor, again, uh, with two CubeSats. And the two CubeSats were to measure the seasonal variations and the um, and if we got lucky with the with the deployment, we can even do diurnal. But that depends on how these two cube sets get deployed. So a little bit about the mission concept. Uh, it, it includes again about 40 worth of a uh, payload space, very low swap, less than five kilograms, uh, and uh, less than um, um, six watts. Actually, this is uh, also almost five watts, but with some conversion losses it, in the power supply, it can be as high as six watts, but the payload itself is only about four watts. Uh, and uh, it, again, implements a two-look calibration, looking at space view and an internal uh, absorption target. And uh, this was using very different kind of technology. This is in the far IR, and we used uh, room temperature, thermopile detectors uh, with an uh, uh, optics front end, which is uh, a short shield telescope with an offner spectrometer. So I'll get into the instrument architecture in a bit, but the mission concept was to deploy the two uh, CubeSats and maybe uh, mainly make measurements over the poles uh, to understand the, the variability in the fluxes uh, over the spectral regions, mostly uh, from five microns to 54 microns. And we also have the zeroth order measurement for calibration. The idea is to have two CubeSats in asynchronous orbits. So we get overlapping measurements separated by zero to 12 hours, depending on how they are deployed. Let's see here. And we also have calibration that occurs um, basically to look at uh, space view and internal um, ambient target almost about uh, eight times in an orbit. The instrument architecture is uh, we receive thermal radiation. 
uh, and uh, from the earth. And we have, again, a stepper motor that allows us to look at a calibration target, which is located internally, and then look at uh, our um, space, cold sky space view. Uh, we have, like I mentioned, a Schwarzschild telescope uh, and a Offner grading spectrometer. And then we had uh, order sorting uh, interference filters that allows us to uh, uh, basically uh, split up the 5 to 54 micron uh, band into subbands. And then we have a 64 by 8 array of uh, thermopile detector, room temperature uh, thermopile detectors. And uh, the 64 by 8, 512 pixels are then read out uh, by using CMOS uh, readout integrated circuits. These ROICs were externally fabricated um, by uh, Black Forest Engineering. The thermopile detector is a JPL design and implemented at JPL and fabricated at JPL. And then uh, your standard engineering uh, command and data handling unit that kind of took all of those 512 pixels simultaneously measured and packetized that and uh, transmitted to the spacecraft. Uh, again, here, basically, we took optics from the moon meteorology mapper, which was implemented in uh, Chandrayaan, uh, and made it, uh, miniaturized it so it could fit in a CubeSat form factor. So on the, on the right, you see the, the optics, the uh, aperture for the nadir viewing um, uh, port, as well as the, the space view port. And uh, we have, uh, like I mentioned, the... Uh, the pointing mirror that then that then uh, transmits the signal into the telescope, which is Schwarzschild telescope with the primary, secondary, and then uh, to the toroidal mirror. And then we have a diffraction grading and then gets uh, through the order sorting filters into the focal plane array. And the focal plane array, as I mentioned, has 64 uh, spectral uh, by eight spatial pixels. And uh, they basically form uh, the uh, a cross track sort of uh, uh, footprints, um, eight spatial footprints, if you will, about 14 by 14 kilometers. So very um, different implementation compared to some of our other uh, focal plane arrays, uh, but uh, something that's never been done before in the spectral range. Uh, and it's a passively cooled thermal architecture, so that is very uh, uh, um, uh, something that can be implemented in a CubeSat uh, low power uh, sort of configuration, very benign thermal environments, operating set points from 0 to 40 C, very similar to Tempest-D. Uh, like I mentioned, this is a key component that allows the implementation of pre-fire, which is a, the thermal pile detectors implemented at the uh, the micro devices laboratory at JPL, and uh, uh, these these work on the Seebeck effect uh, and uh, provide a voltage that's proportional to the thermal radiation that's uh, in incident on the each of these thermopiles. And uh, again, the key. Uh, requirement is the, the low noise capability of these detectors. And uh, indeed, they, at room temperature, they're able to uh, provide less than 100 nanovolt per root hertz. That uh, provides about one and a half Kelvin worth uh, equivalent any delta T for, these, uh, for this measurement. So uh, again, we built two of these uh, thermal infrared uh, uh, spectrometers and uh, implemented that in these two 60 CubeSat buses provided by Blue Canyon. Uh, instrument again occupies about 4U of volume with the 2U of uh, avionics from BCT and the, the whole uh, spacecraft structure also built by BCT. Uh, here is all of our uh, instrument hardware that was implemented. We have completed uh, the uh, development of these uh, spectrometers and uh, 
delivered the instruments to the spacecraft. The spacecraft went through its environmental testing campaign, and the two CubeSats are uh, waiting for the launch. The launch was recently announced by uh, in uh, with Rocket Labs, and they're going to be launched from New Zealand in the next uh, next quarter, I believe. Um, to, into polar orbits. So very exciting work uh, and uh, went through all of its uh, environmental testing and uh, very uh, incredible results. You know, I was uh, uh, part of this instrument development for almost two and a half years. And this was during when, uh, when we had the COVID lockdown. So it was very, very challenging to actually finish the flight implementation. These are all cost cap, very cost constrained missions. So uh, there was a very limited opportunity to get more cost. Um, although NASA did uh, provide some additional cost funding to incur all of the delays we had due to the lockdown. But compared to some of the big missions we work on, this is very, very small. And uh, it was extremely challenging to build these instruments during the lockdown, but uh, it was completed and we got great results. We had to do a spectral response function and cross-track response function calibration. Uh, we had a very uh, extensive calibration equipment using a monochromator to inject light from five to 54 microns and measure the uh, spectral response function. So got excellent results from eight to 28 microns. So it was very well behaved. We did have some stray light uh, and electronic crosstalk between the readout integrated circuits, upwards of 28 microns that increased the noise a bit, but it's still a very unique and valuable measurement at these, um, at these wavelengths, which have never been done before. And this was very, very outside my expertise. So it was almost like getting another PhD for me. Uh, but uh, that was uh, a, a great project. Now, moving along to uh, EASY, which is the electro uh, Electrojet Xemon Imaging Explorer. It's called EASY. Uh, be very careful when you name a, a, a project EASY. It's never easy. Uh, but <laughs> here we are. We have uh, EASY, which is a very cost-effective three CubeSat mission. Uh, that for the first time is going to use remote sensing to make measurements of the magnetic field uh, electrojet currents. So very, very unique application of millimeter wave radiometers uh, for NASA heliophysics. So typically we use these uh, technologies like you saw for precipitation measurements, atmospheric sounding, water vapor, temperature. But in this case, we are going to be using the Zeeman effect for uh, remote sensing of the magnetic electrojet currents in the 100 to 130 kilometer altitude, which is very difficult to explore because you can't put magnetometers at that height. You don't have balloons or spacecraft that can make those measurements in situ. So you need to use remote sensing. And basically, these are, uh, these are going to pave the way for understanding how these uh, uh, magnetic field currents develop uh, these auroral electrojets over the poles and paves the way for understanding space weather and solar storms and their impact on uh, other satellites and what have you. But basically, EASY is a three CubeSat constellation. Again, pearls on a string configuration and each cube, six U CubeSat again. Uh, and each of these six U CubeSats are two to 10 minutes apart. Uh, and inside each uh, 60 CubeSat, you have four millimeter wave 118.75 gigahertz dual polarized radiometers and uh, no moving parts, nothing is scanning, but you sort of have these four beams simultaneously measuring uh, the uh, thermal radiation at 118.75 gigahertz and uh, providing these measurements uh, from each of these CubeSats allows us to measure the spatial and temporal evolution of these uh, magnetic field induced effects. So what's the Zeeman effect? You basically have a 118.75 gigahertz spectral line, which is the oxygen resonance. In the presence of the magnetic field at 100 kilometers, this spectral line splits. And that's what you're seeing on the left. And the magnitude of the split uh, is proportional to the, the, the magnitude of the magnetic field. So we, our requirement is to measure the magnetic field with uh, uh, 
using the 118 giga 118.75 gigahertz measurement and to better than 200 nanoteslas. Now, there is a polarimetric aspect to this. We are measuring horizontal and vertical polarization for each of those beams. And uh, using the H and V, we are going to be computing uh, uh, the third and fourth stokes. And so that we get a full Stokes vector that allows us to measure the uh, full, full polarization state and the magnetic field direction as well. So that's what you see on the right here. You have, uh, depending on the presence of the magnetic field, we have horizontal, vertical, and the third and fourth Stokes from each of those four beams. Um, and that's used for deriving the magnetic field direction. I'm not an expert in uh, magnetic field retrievals, but uh, uh, my job is to build the most uh, sensitive radiometers and uh, or uh, with the best radiometric resolution possible for this measurement. So we had some heritage. Uh, this was selected in 2021, and we started in uh, in June of 2021 is when we started the uh, phase B or the preliminary design phase. Um, our heritage was all the work we did on Tempest-D, very similar technology, the same 35 nanometer indium phosphide technology implemented at 118.75 gigahertz. And then um, the back end, which in this case uh, was using um, another implementation on a recent CubeSat mission, which actually uh, launched with Tempest-D. So Tempest-D and Qbert were in the same uh, or, or in dispensers, which were side by side. So they will launch one behind the other uh, within minutes apart from the ISS. And Qbert was a mission that uh, was used to uh, understand the uh, uh, radio frequency interference uh, from 6 to 40 gigahertz. And this had a digital backend, an FPGA-based backend, uh, Xilinx Zinc FPGA, that implemented uh, all of the RFI algorithms on board. Uh, and the front end was built by Goddard, and the PI was Ohio, uh, Joel Johnson at Ohio State. So this was, a uh, again, a NASA ESTO-funded uh, invest program, Qbert, uh, which was also in a 6 view CubeSat and implemented this digital backend, which was uh, developed by JPL. So we took advantage of that design, which was a similar design was also flown on SMAP. The digital backend in that case was built by Goddard, a uh, similar FPGA based uh, digital backend. So you basically take your IF signal and you um, uh, uh, basically sample it, digitize it, and then in the FPGA, you have a polyphase filter and uh, an FIR filter followed by an FFT. So you basically divide your IF band of, let's say, 50 megahertz. We can even do up to many gigahertz now in the radio astronomy community. I believe it's like 10 gigahertz on uh, some of the radio telescope um, test beds, but uh, you basically split it into a number of channels and you have uh, spectral resolution and uh, uh, on the order of tens of kilohertz and uh, you basically have a spectrum analyzer as your back end. So this is uh, extremely uh, uh, challenging to implement in a CubeSat because an FPGA based uh, spectrometer can take uh, upwards of 10 to 15 watts. So this uh, easy mission used the Qbert uh, heritage and implemented a similar uh, polyphase filter bank uh, FFT spectrometer uh, in its uh, digital backend uh, using the Kintex Ultrascale FPGA in the case of EASY because we want it to be more uh, radiation tolerant. And uh, so we have the front end heritage from Tempest, uh, digital spectrometer heritage from Qbert, and uh, are on the way of implementing EASY. EASY will launch in uh, October of 2024, or worst case, February of 2025, depending on how and when things get ready. But we are uh, manifested for the transporter, or not manifested, but uh, selected for the transporter 13 SpaceX launch, which is in October 24. And we are frantically trying to build all this hardware. We have about a dozen radiometers, as you can see. So each of those yellow blocks are 118 gigahertz radiometers. And I will show more details in a minute. And this is a mission that's supposed to last 18 months on orbit. 
uh, including the 15 months, uh, sorry, including three months of commissioning. So 15 months of science operation plus three months of commissioning. And uh, it's going to be launched. Uh, uh, the 325 is going to be harder to meet, but about 450 to 625 kilometers uh, orbit altitude range. Uh, and then again, uh, two to 10 minutes apart between each of these uh, CubeSats. Again, partnering with Blue Canyon. So this is a partnership with APL, JPL, and Blue Canyon. APL is the PI. Uh, Dr. Sam Yi or Jeng Wa Yi is the PI of the mission. It's a NASA heliophysics mission uh, and uh, managed by the Explorers, NASA Explorers Office, Program Office. Uh, and JPL is uh, delivering the three MEM instruments, microwave electrojet magnetogram instruments, uh, which are the 118.75 gigahertz uh, radiometers that I just described. And then Blue Canyon is building the spacecraft and also operating the spacecraft. And APL has uh, most of the science team as well as the science operation center uh, for out of APL and the project oversight and management. So here's a measurement concept for easy. We have the three CubeSats uh, flying over the poles and making auroral electrojet measurements. So before the science measurement, it, it pitches up, look at, look at cold sky, and then looks down, makes the uh, sort of push proof measurements. Same thing on the second and the third CubeSat. Again, flips back up to do a calibration, uh, like you see on the first one now, and then it's out of the poles. So basically the uh, science operation is about 15 minutes over the poles and over the uh, rest of the orbit, we just keep our radiometer front ends uh, powered on, they low power, but we turn off the FPGA and basically are in a standby mode till we come over the poles again and uh, repeat and do the same thing. So calibration, science measurement of 10 minutes, calibration again, and then in standby because of the power consumption of the instrument and the amount of power these CubeSats can provide. Uh, we are about 17 watts uh, in a fully operational science mode. And then when we turn the FPGAs off, we can be around uh, 10 to 11 watts. So like I said, uh, sun-synchronous orbit, and then most of the science measurements are higher than the 55 magnetic latitude to make our auroral electrojet measurements. That's the primary objective. We also have an uh, augmented objective, which is the uh, electro equatorial electrojets, which is sort of a nice to have, which we will uh, look into after we finish our primary uh, objectives are satisfied. Okay, so a little bit about the MEM instrument architecture. Uh, Nothing is scanning here. We have a static four reflectors at 118.75 uh, and a very, very tiny Potter feed horn that receives the 118.75 signal. We have an orthomode transducer uh, inside each of those four receivers that splits the polarization into horizontal and vertical. Again, using uh, the low noise amplifier, 35 nanometer technology and uh, all of these LNAs are designed by Pekka Kangashlati at JPL and uh, fabricated uh, in North of Grumman uh, using the 35 nanometer uh, foundry run. Uh, the FPGA based digital spectrometer was uh, designed by uh, initially for a lot of research programs by uh, Javier Bosch. And uh, we took that implementation and Mandy Wang has implemented it in a uh, a more flight-like uh, uh, configuration. So uh, the low noise amplifiers amplify the, uh, I mean, the whole front end architecture, uh, the front end uh, of the receiver almost provides 80 to 100 dB of gain here. So we have the low noise amplifier amplifying the signal. Then we have a subharmonic mixer. We have a single phase lock oscillator that uh, provides the 118.75 divided by four, 29.682, which then gets doubled and then uh, is provided to all the four receivers uh, times two. So to eight uh, down conversion chains, uh, so eight mixers rather. So each instrument has uh, 
six LNAs in one block, so times four, uh, 24 LNAs and uh, eight mixers in each instrument. So uh, at the end of the day, we have 72 LNAs and 24 mixers, quite a, quite a, uh, quite a challenge with all this packaging and uh, engineering uh, implementation. So uh, we take the local oscillator at 59.364 gigahertz, and then uh, inside the subharmonic mixer, uh, the 118.75 plus 22 megahertz is uh, mixed with 118.75 and out comes 22 megahertz IF in I and Q. And then we have a hybrid to split the two sidebands and we basically take one of the sidebands uh, and uh, out comes the two IFs for H and V. And out of the four receivers, we have um, H and V IF coming out. So we have uh, four H-pole uh, IFs and four V-pole IF outputs, which are then sampled by eight ADCs with uh, 100 mega samples per second, 50 megahertz bandwidth. And then uh, the sampled and digitized output is then fed into our FPGA to compute the third and fourth Stokes parameters. And we have a Virago microprocessor that uh, allows for all the packetizing and uh, communication with the spacecraft. This is also a BCT uh, partnership, so they're providing the 6 cube CubeSats again. We have a very stable chip scale atomic clock from Microsemi that provides the 10 megahertz reference to lock our face lock oscillator. So we have a very stringent uh, or a very constrained frequency stability requirement because of the, the Zeeman splitting and the, and the spectral measurement that we're trying to make. We need to be stable to better than five kilohertz over 200 seconds to be able to make this measurement. So we have this chip scale atomic clock, which is extremely stable and implemented in our electronics. So here's quickly how the instrument is packaged in a 4U volume. Again, this is a slightly more power consumptive instrument than Tempest-D and Prefire uh, because of the FPGA spectrometer that we implement. And we have four receivers, as I mentioned, a very densely packed instrument. Uh, and then the phase lock oscillator is a single phase lock oscillator, which is power divided and providing um, the oscillator frequency to the four receivers. Let's see here. And here's voila, our first instrument. So here's our CAD and here's a real instrument. So we've built our first instrument and we are in the process of environmentally testing this instrument before we deliver our first instrument to Blue Canyon. And then following that, we're gonna be delivering the second and the third in February of next year. So yes, a very busy time building dozens of radiometers and implementing uh, uh, the test campaign. So. Here we are showing uh, that the noise equivalent, uh, actually the receiver noise temperature is better than uh, 450 Kelvin. That allows us to meet our uh, better than um, uh, three Kelvin requirement on HNV. Uh, and very easily we have a lot of margin. And uh, that's basically summarizing all of the technology that uh, I've been recently working on over the last eight years, very low, uh, mass, power, volume type of technology that enables low cost constellations and uh, allows for measurement of observables with rapid revisit rate, which is difficult to implement with a single flagship mission. So thank you. That was a lot. <laughs> but... <laughs> Wonderful. No, thank you. That was, that was a very inspiring and exciting talk. Um, we have one question so far in the Q&A, which I'll read, and we've got about six minutes for questions. So the first question is, as the availability to do useful science with CubeSats rise, I can imagine it will come with increased power requirements for the payload and the bus as well. Can you shed some light on how this technology, battery, solar panels, has evolved over the last decade and what the current state of the art power delivery capacities is for a 3U CubeSat to support a typical radiometer payload? So 3U CubeSat, I think uh, with the amount of solar panels and battery you can actually implement, you can probably have a payload that can uh, dissipate no more than three watts. That would be my 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 thinking. Uh, obviously you have, have six U's and 12 U's that have come over the last decade that allows you to uh, increase the size of your payload a bit uh, and uh, implement, you know, more power consumptive payloads. And uh, with, uh, with a 6U, with the number of deployables, uh, you can probably go to about a 20 watt payload. 
uh, with some duty cycling, not continuously operating, depending on your observable, you know, you can also, we're also getting into more smart sensors where you can, uh, you know, implement some onboard AI machine learning sort of capability where you can turn on your sensor when you have your target observable of interest. So, you know, those kind of uh, techniques are coming in the future. Uh, so to answer 3U is quite limiting for science instruments. <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, a, a good, uh, a good uh, avenue to test new technology, but to have real capable science measurements, you probably have to go into the 6 and 12U and maybe even into the small SAT domain. The small SATs with the 50 to 100 kilogram payload uh, are not that uh, uh, dif difficult to find launches for, you know, with the ESPA rings and those. It's slightly more expensive in launches, but not as expensive as your big flagship mission. So there's a whole a slew of uh, opportunities available. And Darren says, I don't know if I answered that question completely, but, you know, feel free to uh, email us if you have any questions. What do you think is the next low swap technology for millimeter wave radiometers? Uh, good question. You know, improving architecture, maybe going into uh, correlation radiometers, maybe going to go into photonic radiometers. I, like I said, smart sensors where you can have more... Uh, um, adaptive sensors where you can even have a uh, wider frequency range of radiometers, radars. Uh, we are also going into more higher frequencies like uh, 400 to 800 gigahertz. As you know, you know Goddard has, uh, uh, has a new Earth Ventures uh, project they're working on for cloud ice. So yeah, going more into the millimeter wave and looking at more observables at JPL, we're also looking at uh, planetary boundary layer. Uh, but again, those technologies will require deployable reflectors and, uh, you know, because as you're lower in frequency, you need a bigger aperture size. So yeah, that's sort of a uh, few things I'm aware of. I'm sure, Darren, you probably know better than me, but uh, here we are. That's great. Well, I, with two minutes left, I'll ask one, uh, which is, I guess, like from a big picture point of view, as you see this arc, what do you think the portfolio, the long term or near future steady state of mission sizes, if you could allocate across how many at each scale, what do you think is like the upcoming optimal portfolio? Uh, again, depends on, you know, what... Uh what the new decadal survey, I mean, I'm talking about NASA goals. Uh, again, we sort of um, uh, set our roadmap based on the new observables that we are interested in. But this definitely opens a new opportunity of constellations, which didn't exist in the last, you know, 10, 10 15 years ago, implementing many, many um, satellite sensors, which are spaced uh, close to each other. Uh, to make these more uh, temporal and spatially resolved measurements. Uh, it's definitely going to be the new capability and coming up with new measurement concepts and new type of sensors targeting different observables. That That's, that's going to be the new paradigm here. I don't know if I fully answered your question, but that, nope, that's, that's, that's great. That's great. Well, thank you so much for giving this talk and thank you again for your, your patience with our uh, IT challenges last time. Um, no I'll remind you. Everyone, again, uh, if you have, uh, if you want to give a talk or know someone you'd love to see, please drop me an email. And thanks again, Sharmila. It was wonderful. And see you all next month. Thank you. Bye.